Hello, hello, and welcome to Miss Hope's Reading Hour. So glad to be here with you all this evening. So glad to um, finally be on. Had a bit of an appliance issue, my friends. So as you all know, in our homes, we have refrigerators and dryers and washers and things. So my refrigerator almost died. So I had to call somebody to fix it. And I was running a little behind time because of that. So I was like, let's push that back about 15 minutes. And now look, I'm here with you all and I'm so happy about it. So how was your weekend? Hopefully you had a great weekend. Hopefully you rested, maybe rested your eyes some from your screens. I know that's kind of hard with all of the fun things that are due on our phones and iPads and tablets and computers and everything. But hopefully you had some time other than sleep to take a little screen break, okay? Hopefully you had time to spend with your family family and friends, maybe give someone a call, something like that, or that you had time to donate to our last organization. Okay, let's see, which one was it? I know we've done so many. Heifer International, remember? The one that we read the story about how this organization gives animals to people around the world to help them start a new business, nourish their family, and help their own community. And today we have a new organization on day. I don't even, okay. I don't even have fingers anymore. So we were on day 10. Now we're on day 11. 11, can you believe it? from when we started a couple of Fridays ago. Now we are on day 11 of the 12 days of donations. Can you believe it? 10 and one more if I had more fingers, but that would be a little creepy. So I'm good with the 10 I got. 10 plus one more means we are on day 11 of our 12 days of donations. So our new organization is right here, the Greater Philadelphia Coalition Against Hunger. So fun fact that I didn't know is that I actually had some dealings with this organization and had no idea about it. I didn't even know. I was like, wait a minute. I didn't know that when I did the walk for hunger, okay, that I actually was working with the Greater Philadelphia Coalition Against Hunger. Didn't know that. And I did it for a few years, actually, um, with my former church. I was being a part of the walk for hunger. Me and the youth group that I was working with didn't even know it. So as we've talked about throughout these last 11 um, days of donations, I'm sorry. Um, we've talked about organizations here in the city of Philadelphia and ones all around the country and the world. So today and on our wonderful Wednesday, we will be talking about organizations here in the greater Philadelphia area. So how about I tell you some things about the Coalition Against Hunger? They actually do a lot. Like so many of these organizations, they don't do just one thing and they don't fight hunger and food insecurity in just one way. So my friends, Let's read you some things about the Greater Philadelphia Coalition Against Hunger. Imagine the courage it takes to pick up the phone, call a total stranger, and admit that you don't have enough food to feed your family. 
imagine that. Imagine what that would be like. So the Coalition Against Hunger says at our office, this happens dozens of times a day. And it is what drives us. Hunger hits every zip code and chances are strong that you know someone who faces or has faced hunger, even if they never voiced their struggle. For more than two decades, we have fought hunger in the greater Philadelphia region with one guiding principle. Hunger is preventable, meaning that we can make it so that no one suffers with hunger and food insecurity. Founded in 1996, the Greater Philadelphia Coalition Against Hunger strives to build a community where all people have the food they need to lead healthy lives. The coalition connects people with food assistance programs and nutrition education, provides resources to a network of food pantries, and educates the public and policymakers about responsible solutions that prevent people from going hungry. And these are the ways that they do that. They have immediate relief, which means they connect people with food pantries or they give people food. So it says we provide close to 200,000 pounds, which is a lot of food, um, for food pantries each year. There's short-term relief. They also help people sign up for what's known as food stamps or SNAP benefits to help them to pay for the groceries that they would buy at the grocery store. Also, there's long-term relief where at the local and local, state, and federal levels, we call for support, we call for and support responsible policies that address the realities families face putting food on their tables. We advocate on behalf of those who face food insecurity to ensure that they have a voice in shaping responsible solutions to hunger in both local and national policy regulations. That means they go to the people in government to help um, make policies that will make hunger not a reality for people anymore. So the Greater Philadelphia Coalition Against Hunger does a lot and they have events. They have a run against hunger and they have a walk against hunger, which I have participated in with some youth that I worked with at my church. We've partic we participated in it for about three years in a row and it's a great walk and the money that you raise from your walk, it provides money for your food pantry. So it's not that you're raising all this money and then you have to give all of it back to the organization, which the organization does great work. But the money that you raise, you take it back to your organization and that goes toward more food in your food pantry. So... My friends, on this 11th day of donations, please do donate to the Greater Philadelphia Coalition Against Hunger. How do you do that? I knew you'd ask that. It's day 11. I know, I know these things now. I know you're going to ask. So how would you do that? You would go to hungercoalition.org. And there is a nice little button at the top that says give now. That is how my young ones, my older young ones, my friends, my teacher friends, my parent friends, my parent teacher friends, people I don't know. That is how you can join with Miss Hope's Reading Hour and make a donation, okay? Now my friends, there is something else that was in the teaser that I wanted to talk about. And hopefully I get to see it tonight. So there is a celestial event tonight. Apparently Jupiter and Saturn will come close together 
and it will shine brightly in what is known as the star of Bethlehem. So I want to see that in the sky. That is why we have one of our books today talking about stars. Hopefully now from what I saw, it says that you have to go out and see it before 8 p.m. And we'll be done before then. We'll be done, okay? So hopefully we will get to see that. I wanna take my nephews out to see if we can see it. I'm gonna go out first. And then if I see it, I'm gonna like, come on out here, we gotta see this, okay? And today we will also with one of our books be talking about the holiday of Han um, not Hanukkah, sorry, Kwanzaa. We will be talking about the holiday of Kwanzaa. That's why I wanted to wear something kind of vibrant for the stars and for Kwanzaa. Okay, so now let's get into the books we will be reading today. So our first book that we will be reading is Together for Kwanzaa. This book is by Jawanda G. Ford, illustrated by Shelley Hehenberger or Hehenberger. I apologize if I butchered your name, okay? This one is called Together for Kwanzaa. I read this book and I was like, oh, I love this book. It's so sweet. And our next book for our celestial event is called How Many Stars in the Sky? Have you ever wondered? This book is by Lenny Hort, paintings by James E. Ransom. And of course, in a reading rainbow selection. How many stars? And hopefully we will get to finding out more about who is stealing the 12 days of Christmas, okay? Now, my friends, let's get to the books. And while I am opening this book, let me let you know this wonderful music that you're hearing. And this wonder, these wonderful books we will be reading. Unfortunately, Miss Hope does not own the rights to any of them, but they are here for your listening and reading enjoyment. Now, together for Kwanzaa. Oh, who, wrote, who publishes this book? Oh, this is a Random House picture back book. It was the first day of Kwanzaa and Kayla was sad. Her big brother, Kyrie, could not come home for the holidays because a heavy snowstorm had closed all the roads around his school. Kayla always missed Kyrie while he was away, but this was worse than ever. Now they would have to start Kwanzaa without him. Kwanzaa was Kayla's favorite time of year. She loved celebrating her African heritage and doing special things with her family. But how could she enjoy Kwanzaa this year if Kyrie was not a part of it? Yeah, that's not quite so fun. But we'll see how it goes. Kayla tried to cheer up. After dressing in colorful African clothing, she began to set the Kwanzaa table. First, she put down the makeka, a traditional straw mat. On top of the makeka, she placed the kinara, a Kwanzaa candle holder. The kinara holds seven candles, one for each night of Kwanzaa, a black candle in the middle, three red candles on the left, and three green candles on the right. The colors stand for different things, Black is for the African-American people, red is for their struggles, and green for the hope and for hope and good fortune. That's her with the makeka and the kinara. Each night of Kwanzaa, families light candles and celebrate one of the seven Kwanzaa principles which are ideas that help people to be strong. The principles help to guide them through Kwanzaa, but are practiced all year long. 
there is a different principle for each day of Kwanzaa. Every year, Kayla and Kyrie would share the Kwanzaa greeting. Habari Gani, Kyrie would say. The greeting is from the Swahili language. It means, what is happening today? Kayla would answer with the Kwanzaa principle for the day. Many Swahili words are used during Kwanzaa. Kayla sighed. It just wouldn't be the same without Kyrie tonight. Kayla's parents helped her place fruits and vegetables on the makeka. The fruits and vegetables are called mazal. They represent the harvest and the importance of working together. Here is the corn, said Kayla. Do you remember the Swahili word? Her mother asked. Muhindi, Kayla answered. The Muhindi represents the children of the family. She put two ears of corn next to each other. I'm sorry, she put two ears of corn next to the other Kwanzaa symbols, one for her and one for Kyrie. When the table was set, Kayla's mother helped her light the black candle. Kayla knew that they would light a red candle the second night, a green one the, night, the next night, and so on, until all the candles were burning on the last night. Since Kyrie was not there, Kayla's father greeted her. Habarigani, he said. Kayla answered with the first principle of Kwanzaa, Umoja, she said. Umoja means unity. Kayla's father poured a few drops of water from the Kikombe Cha, cha Umoja, getting them to Kwahili words, the Kikombe Cha Umoja, or unity cup to remember and honor their ancestors. At Kwanzaa, everyone drinks from the unity cup to celebrate family and community unity. Kayla and her family practiced unity all year by spending time together as a family. Kayla especially loved family movie night they would rent movies and eat pizza and popcorn all night long. Thinking about movie night made Kayla miss Kyrie even more. Family movie night, it's pretty fun. Oh, skip the page. The next night, Kayla's father lit the black candle and the first red candle. He said, Kuji Cha Gulia, which is the second principle of Kwanzaa. It means self-determination or deciding what you want to be and do. Kayla decided she wanted to go to college just like Kyrie and study to become a scientist. That is a perfect thing to do. Me and chemistry just didn't seem to get along so well. Me and art liked each other a lot. <laughs> On the third night, the phone rang just as Kayla was lighting the first green candle. It was Kyrie. Habari Gani, Kyrie said. Ujima, Kayla answered. Ujima is the third principle of Kwanzaa. It means working together and being responsible. One way Kayla and her family practiced Ujima during the year was by participating in her school's bake sale. The teachers, parents, and students all worked together to raise money for the community.
New books, new pages. The black candle, one green candle, and two red candles were lit on the fourth night. Kayla was really happy tonight. The roads were cleared and Kyrie was on his way home. The principal of the fourth night of Kwanzaa was Ujama. Ujama means cooperative economics or supporting African-American businesses. Kayla and her parents loved shopping in Tubman Square where African-Americans sold handmade jewelry, hats, and clothes. The phone rang and Kayla ran to answer it. Hi Kyrie, are you almost home? She asked. Kyrie explained that his car had broke down on the way. It would be, it would take a few days to fix. Kayla burst into tears. There were only three days of Kwanzaa left. Kyrie would miss everything. Don't cry, sweetie, Kyrie said. I'll see you real soon. I promise. Yeah, that is kind of disappointing when you think they're almost home. On the fifth night, Kayla's mother lit the candles. Today's principal was Nia, or purpose. Kayla decided that her purpose was to be the best little sister she could be. She made Kyrie a special Kwanzaa scrapbook telling him about how the family celebrated this year. Kuumba, or creativity, is the principle for the sixth day of Kwanzaa. After the last red candle was lit, Kayla and her parents made lots of decorations for the Kuramu that night. The Kuramu is a feast where families celebrate with friends and loved ones. Kayla made a flag using the Kwanzaa colors. It was black, red, and green, just like the candles in the Kinara. Soon there was a knock at the door. Kayla ran to answer it. Kyrie, she yelled as she opened the door wide. No, not Kyrie, but grandma and grandpa are here. Kayla was glad to see her grandparents, but she couldn't help being disappointed that Kyrie still had not arrived. She kept hoping that somehow he'd get home before Kwanzaa was over. There were many knocks on the door from friends and family. It was hard to be sad with so many people around. Everyone was enjoying the karamu. There was so much food. They had to have a separate table just for desserts. No one heard Kyrie at the front door, so he just walked right in. Kayla squealed with delight when she saw him. You made it, Kayla said, smiling. I took a taxi to a bus, he answered, just to see you. Kayla hugged Kyrie as tight as she could. Imani, Kyrie whispered on the last night of Kwanzaa. Tonight, all the candles glowed brightly. Imani means faith, believing in yourself and others. I believe in our family, Kayla said, as they opened their zawadi or gifts. Kayla knew that zawadi should be handmade or educational. She gave everyone a photo of the family in a frame she had made from old newspapers. Everyone loved their Zawadi, especially Kyrie. The end. A girl after my own heart, she made those 
by herself. So that is the holiday of Kwanzaa. This was a very good book. It didn't just talk about the days. It talked about what all of those days mean. It was beautiful. Talked about the Kinara. And we talked about Hanukkah, right? Which is kind of similar to the Hanukkah. Um, I'm sorry. I just remembered. I'm trying to remember. The candle holder for... Hanukkah. This is such a good book. And the pictures are beautiful too. And her brother made it home. Amazing. He must really love his sister. Okay. He must really love his sister to take a taxi to a bus just to get home to his sister. And just like all of the other holidays, though many of them are connected to religious observance, Kwanzaa is not. It's the idea of us working together, having faith and hope in our future and purpose in our lives. So it is celebrated by African-Americans, but guess what? Just because you're not African-American doesn't mean that you can't celebrate Kwanzaa because we should all want to live by those principles, right? So that is our story about Kwanzaa. Now, when we think about that feast that they had, it makes me think about how there's many people, even if they want to celebrate Kwanzaa, they will not be able to have a feast like that if it were not for organizations like the Coalition Against Hunger. So I invite you and encourage you to come alongside Ms. Hope's Reading Hour and make a donation to the Coalition Against Hunger. How do you do that again? You go to hungercoalition.org and at the top has a nice little button that says give now. So you click on that button and whatever you want to donate, of course it has suggestions, but right there at the bottom, there's an empty box. And if you decide you wanna donate a dollar, you wanna donate $5, you wanna donate $10, you can make that donation to help others have a wonderful, bountiful feast like um, Kayla and her family had, where they even had to have a table for desserts. They can have a bountiful feast like their family because of your donation. Now, let us get to how many stars in the sky? How many do you think there are? I can't wait to go outside after we're done to see if we will be able to see stars that star of Bethlehem in the sky. How many stars in the sky? By Lenny Hort. Paintings by James Ransom. This is a mulberry paperback book. And these pictures are beautiful as well. How many stars in the sky? Mama was away that night and I couldn't sleep. Mama knows all about the sun and stars, but she's away and I didn't want to wake daddy. So I stared out the window asking myself, how many stars in the sky? I couldn't count. I could count so many just from my room. I leaned out the window and I could count even more. That was just gazing over the backyard. How many stars in the sky? Look at those pictures. I went outside with a pad and pencil. I started to count. I filled up one whole page of the pad, but there were lots of stars hidden behind the trees. The house blocked out even more. 
The street lamp was so bright, I couldn't see stars anywhere near it. How many stars in the sky? I climbed high up into my treehouse. I stared, I started at the Big Dipper and counted in a great circle all around the sky. I filled up page after page of the pad. But when I got back to the Dipper, it wasn't where I remembered it. I must have been out so long that the stars had moved, old ones had set, new ones had risen. How many stars in the sky? That's a big feat to try to count all the stars. I climbed down from the treehouse and there was daddy. I couldn't sleep, I said. I can't sleep either, he said. Your mama won't be back till tomorrow. I told him how I wanted to count all the stars in the sky. If your mama was here, daddy said, I bet she'd know. Maybe you and I can find some place where it'll be easier to count them. I wonder where that place is. To count all the stars in the sky. My dog hopped in the truck. Oops, I think I might have missed a page. No, I didn't. My, do my dog hopped in the truck with us and we drove into town. The streets were quiet, but lots of street lights were burning. We could see the bright city skyline in the distance. Daddy and I counted 25 or 26 stars. He said he thought one of them was the planet Jupiter. We're gonna be seeing that tonight. This isn't a good place to see stars, I said. It's not a bad place to count them though, he said. But it's still too hard. Let's go where it'll be really easy. Let's see where that is. We drove into the city. The big clock by the tunnel said 2.45, but neither one of us felt like sleeping. Two forty-five in the morning? We parked by Mama's office. There was a department store with brightly lit displays in every window. There were street lamps on every corner. They were, there were dazzling neon signs. Headlights flashed from a steady stream of cars. Powerful searchlights beamed from the roofs of the skyscrapers. I don't know. Might be hard to see the stars with all that. Let's see where they're gonna go. And I couldn't see any stars at all. I counted exactly one, said Daddy. No, wait, he said. It's an airplane. Maybe the stars just don't want to be counted, I said. That would be a shame. We drove back through the tunnel. I was tired and I thought we were going home, but instead, daddy drove us into the country. Oh. That may be where you can see them. There weren't any cars. There weren't any street lights. There weren't any houses. Even the moon had set. And I knew we could never count all of the stars.
No matter where I looked, new ones appeared every time I blinked my eyes. Daddy pointed up above and showed me the Milky Way. The stars were so thick, I couldn't tell one from another. We were much too tired to drive anymore. So we slept underneath the stars that night. Oh, that is so awesome. That is beautiful. It was daylight when we woke. Daddy, I said, all those stars are always out there, even when we can't see them, right? Of course they are, he said. We can try to count them again sometime, I asked. Any night you feel like it, he said, you and me and Mama can all go out together. I could hardly wait to see Mama and tell her all about it. In a little while, we'd be back home. But now I was glad to just be standing there with Daddy, basking in the warmth of the one star we could see. I wonder what star that was. And that was the sun. <laughs> the end. Oh, that was such a good story. Fun fact about Miss Hope, I love the stars. I love looking up in the sky and seeing the stars and the moon. I often try to take pictures of the moon with my phone. When I'm looking at it, it looks really sharp and clear, but once I take the picture, it's a little fuzzy because of course the moon is far, far, far away from us. But I love taking pictures of things in the sky. I love clouds, I love rainbows, I love stars, and I love the moon. So hopefully tonight, when we go outside to see Saturn and Jupiter come together and shining brightly as the star of Bethlehem, I'll be able to get a picture of it. I'm excited. I really hope I can get a picture. And I hope I can see it so that me and my nephews can go outside and see it together. It's a pretty amazing thing, right? So I love that. I love that book. And the pictures, I told you, I tell you all the time, trust me, the pictures are beautiful and they are. It was beautiful to see the dad and his son and the dog have such a good time together too. Even though their mom was at work, dad came out and said, you know what? Let me go take you to see the stars. So my friends, before we get into who is stealing the 12 days of Christmas, I encourage you again to donate to organization number 11, which is the Greater Philadelphia Coalition Against Hunger. They help so many people and so many other organizations that also help people dealing with hunger and food insecurity. How do you do that? You go to hungercoalition.org. Go to that button at the top that says give now and donate whatever you want to donate. Okay, my young ones, you can donate with your parents, your grandparents, your aunties, your uncles, your brothers or your sisters. How you can work together to help the community. Kwanzaa principle, okay, to help the community. You both get together and you give to the Coalition Against Hunger. I'm just saying. I'm just saying, even if you don't celebrate Kwanzaa, 
that is your way to celebrate it just a little. Now, my friends, we got to get to it. Who is stealing the 12 days of Christmas? So what happened in our last chapter? We were in chapter 15, almost finished that chapter. Now, Alex told Yasmin everything that had happened, okay? And Mr. Stone allowed them to come into his yard because at first they were arguing about it because Mr. Stone seemed like such a curmudgeon type of guy. And they were like, uh, I don't know. Alex said, I, I want to go investigate, but we got to ask him first because we can't just be in his yard. And they were arguing so much, he came to the door. And he was like, listen, what is all this commotion? An old man just wants to relax. And then he said, well, it's too cold out here. How about we go inside? And then after he told, after they told him what happened and that the shadowy figure had run through his yard, he said, you know, which do you prefer in your hot cocoa? Do you prefer um, marshmallows or whipped cream? And he gave them hot chocolate. So maybe just like Bub, Mr. Stone isn't so bad of a guy after all. Now, that is where we are now. After they talked to Mr. Stone and he said, sure, you can be in my yard and investigate just as long as you're not making a whole big racket. Now, this is where we are now in chapter 15 of Who is Stealing? 12 days of Christmas. Outside, Yasmin took charge. It'll go faster if we split up. You try the trees over by the Swansons. I'll try by the corner of the house where you saw the shape last. Looking wasn't so easy. Trees were close together. Their branches drooped and tangled. I grabbed one and shook which got my hands all sappy. And besides, the needles stabbed me. I crawled on the ground to see underneath in the dark. I picked up a stick and poked around. My hands turned black from dirt. My knees were cold, damp, and bruised. I found a lot of pine cones in somebody's old flat beach ball from summer. I found a Barbie doll foot, which was creepy. What happened to the rest of her? I shook an abandoned bird's nest out of a tree. I bothered a gray squirrel. He came out on a branch to scold me. He looked a little like Mr. Stone, but it did. But I didn't find any swan. And besides, all the searching proved what I kept saying, except for the hot chocolate. Detecting was no fun. When I couldn't stand it anymore, I went to find Yasmin. She wasn't by the corner of the house, so I walked around. In the backyard were an ancient rusty swing set and overgrown rose bushes. There was a hedge on the other side of the house next to the D'Agostinos. I jogged alongside it and back to the front yard. Where had Yasmin gone anyway? I didn't want to yell because I didn't want to bug Mr. Stone. But this was ridiculous. Had she gone inside for something? Had she gone home without me? Why would she do that? Talk about being a lousy detective. Now I couldn't even find my own partner. Finally, I decided to go home myself. Maybe she was there. And if she wasn't, I could try calling her house. At my house, I dashed up the walk past the swimming swans the newspaper was still on the front step, which told me my parents weren't up yet. I picked it up. I stopped. Something was wrong. I mean, something was right, wasn't it? I turned around and stared at the blue tarp. One, two, three, four, five, six, 
seven, our missing swan had flown home. Chapter 16. What do you mean, where was I? Yasmin said. Where were you? She was on the phone, calling from her house. I was in the kitchen eating breakfast at last. I had told her about the swan being back. Now we were accusing each other of ditching. Meanwhile, I finally heard shoe thumps upstairs in my parents' room. I looked at the kitchen clock, 10.30. It must be nice to sleep in, I thought. Of course, I wouldn't know. You are the mixed up person, I told Yasmin, because I was looking for you. Well, you weren't doing a very good job of looking, she said. I knew mom would kill me if I was late to babysit Jeremiah again. I tried to find you, but I couldn't, so I left. I looked for you in Mr. Stone's backyard, I said. I looked for you there too, she said. And I was crawling around on my knees, I said. I was crawling too, she said. Look, I think I see what happened. You must have been looking for me at the same time I was looking for you. We were circling Mr. Stone's house, both looking in the same direction, but never in sight of each other. I agreed Yasmin was probably right. But while I was agreeing, something was bugging me. I couldn't get a handle on what it was, though, because, as usual, she was busy running my life. She had to make a peanut butter sandwich for Jeremiah's mid-morning snack. After that, her dad would be home grading finals, and she could come over to my house. We would take a look at the swan to see if there were any clues like price tags or treasure maps. We would tell my mom what we had found out so far. Maybe she could help us. Maybe the police knew something. When Yasmin hung up, I sat and stared at the treasure map. Something was still bugging me. Then I nailed it. Our conversation with Bub. Bub had been teasing us. He said maybe we were the thieves. Maybe our detecting was just a cover up. Well, I knew I was innocent. But what about Yasmin? Till today, I never would have thought of Yasmin, but hadn't she ditched me just now? And ditching wasn't like her either. And wasn't it Yasmin who suggested we split up when we searched for the swan? And Yasmin said, and Yasmin who said I should I should go over by the trees? Yasmin was fast and about the right size. What if she were the shape? If she was, then she knew the swan was in the bushes by Mr. Stone's house because she had put it there. And what if this morning she had grabbed it and run back to my house? What if that was why she wanted to go over to Mr. Stone's in the first place? My brain was very excited. It was going a million miles per hour, but it was also going crazy. Yasmin was my best friend. She was wacko sometimes, but she wasn't a thief. Or was she? At 11.30, Yasmin's dad got home and liberated her. She rang the doorbell. We both went outside. Oh, something flew in front of my face. We both went outside to look at the returned swan. I reached to pick it up. Wait, Yasmin said, what about fingerprints? But I'm wearing mittens and the thief would have too. It's freezing out here. Yasmin nodded. You're right, she said, go ahead. I lifted the swan. From its weight, I could feel there was nothing in it. I wondered if it had been full of mice last night. I turned it over. No price tags inside, nothing inside. That's disappointing, Yasmin said. She looked around on the ground. What about footprints? She isn't sounding like a thief, I thought. The thief wouldn't want me to look for footprints, would she? Brain, I said. Cut it out. 
Yasmin is not the bad guy. She is my friend. I'm not going to suspect her anymore. The ground's too hard for footprints, Yasmin was saying, and there's not enough snow. Same as the sidewalk earlier, I said. Yasmin sighed. Two dead ends in a row, she said, and I thought we were going to solve this case too. Come on, I said, let's talk to mom. Maybe she can help us. Mom was in the kitchen making coffee. She had her uniform on. Her wet hair was dripping on it. You two were up early, mom said. I thought you'd sleep till tomorrow, Alex. And we've been, and we've already been out detecting, Yasmin announced. Detecting, mom said. Well, that's good news. Maybe I can retire to Hawaii at last, she yawned. So tell me, what is it you've detected? Mom sat down at the table with her coffee. She leaned her head on her hand. Yasmin filled her in, the avian alerts, the map, what the map seemed to mean, the swan's disappearance and return. As Yasmin talked, I got worried. What if she said something about the price tag? If mom saw a connection between the mega menagerie case and the missing birds, she'd take our case over herself. That wouldn't be fair. We'd done so much work. I was surprised I felt that way, but I did. Mom pulled the map toward her and studied it. This is really peculiar, she said, but it reinforces my opinion. It's kids. Who else would have come up with a dopey idea like a treasure map? Kids are not dopey, I said. Sorry, honey, she said. I didn't mean that the way it sounded. I thought she meant it precisely how it sounded, but it wasn't worth it to argue. I had to distract Yasmin from telling about the price tag. So I said, what did you find out about your case yesterday, mom? Were you at the, li were you at the library so, were you at the library so late? The library first. Then I went and talked to some folks at the local antique society. They'll talk your ear off, those people. Anyway, you won't believe it. Mom looked up at us. Remember I couldn't figure out a motive for the mega menagerie burglary? Who would want all those mice? But yesterday I heard from a detective over the mountain. There was a similar burglary there, and he shared something he turned up. Something though, sometimes those mice are valuable. I rolled my eyes. Mom, what mom, she asked. You could have talked to any kid on the planet and found that out. Super macho military mice are collectible, especially the retired ones, the ones they don't make anymore. What does collectible mean, Yasmin added? It was nice to explain something to Yasmin for once. It means they get more valuable as they get older. Matt Kaiser even keeps his in plastic bags. He says he wants to corner the market or something like that. It means he'll own so many retired mice. He'll be able to sell them for as much as he wants. I had no idea Matt was such a businessman, mom said. Maybe you should talk to him, I said. Why, mom asked. Maybe he had something to do with the robbery, I said. My sweet little Matt Kaiser? Mom shook her head. I told you already, it wasn't kids. Hey, wait, Ulysses S. Mouse is retired, right? Yasmin asked. So there's a big coincidence, so there's a big coincidence too. Yesterday, Alex and I found, I kicked her. What else could I do? Not hard though. Ow, why'd you? Yasmin started to ask, but my laser look interrupted her. So what did you need the library for, mom? I tried to act cool, like someone who has been kicking his best friend for years. Mom looked at Yasmin, then she looked at me. 
Why did you kick Yasmeen, Alex? What am I missing? He didn't kick me, Mrs. Parakeet. I uh banged my shin on the chair. Sometimes I'm such a klutz. Mom's face was suspicious, but she went ahead and answered. I needed the reference librarian to help me find current prices on antiques. Antiques, I said, but mice aren't old. There's old and then there's old, said mom. A lot of antique stores deal in used stuff, fast food, toys, lunch boxes, baseball cards, even mice. So did you find out what mice are worth? I asked. A lot, mom shook her head. Really? I think people are crazy. Some of those retired mice have sold for a thousand dollars, but they have to be in perfect condition, absolutely clean. The price tag still attached. My friends, we will end right there. So, Alex suspects Yasmin, even though he's trying not to, he suspects Yasmin to be the thief who's stealing the 12 days of Christmas. But then there's this Matt Kaiser who may have had something to do with the mega menagerie robbery. <sighs> Still more questions and more clues. And for whatever reason, now Alex does not want his mother to take the case away from him and Yasmin because they've done too much work. But I suspect that Alex does not want his mother to find out about those military mice that he took from the Maids a Milkins basket. I don't think he wants his mom to find that out. And he still has not told Yasmin. So we know he doesn't want her to find out. So is Yasmin the actual person who has been stealing the 12 days of Christmas and returning it back? Does she secretly like the military mice? Because she makes it seem like it's ridiculous to love these mice so much. But secretly, she may love them a lot. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Maybe she knows the person who has been stealing the 12 days of Christmas. Or she knows the person who has something to do with the robbery. And she's the one stealing the 12 days of Christmas. And they're both working together. That's just a conspiracy theory. But we have more questions and more clues because now the swan is back at Alex Parakeet's house. How did it get there? What clues are they gonna find that have something to do with that swan? We'll get back to it on our fabulous, uh, well, not our fabulous Friday, our wonderful Wednesday. We'll get back to it then. Well, my friends, we are at the end of another Miss Hope's reading hour. Please, please, oh, please make sure that you go to hungercoalition.org to donate to the Greater Philadelphia Coalition Against Hunger. As I said before, all of these organizations, especially during this time where many things and jobs are closed down, it's kind of hard to get those donations and they need them to help people just like you. Remember, hunger is in every zip code and you never know which one of your neighbors, no matter what their house looks like, might be dealing with hunger and food insecurity. So please make sure you go to hungercoalition.org and donate just like Miss Hope's reading hour will be donating. Well, my friends, we are at the end until our wonderful Wednesday. Thank you so much for being here with me. And I will see you next time on Miss Hope's Reading Hour. Until then, my friends, see you next time.